This video is an excerpt from a much longer France travel talk by Steve Smith. To view other topics or to watch Steve's France talk in its entirety, visit ricksteves.com or check out my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Enjoy. Let's explore the eastern corner of the side of this country. I'm not sure which side of France I like better. My house is here in Burgundy region on the eastern side, but boy, every time I travel through the west and the places um, that I get to go every year, I'm never sure where I'd live if I could choose again. But the eastern side will start in, in the Burgundy area and cover the Burgundy and the Alps, which join each other basically for a great central eastern look at this region, at this side of France, I should say. Here you go. Two hours by bullet train, four hours at least by car. Believe me, I know, I've done this a lot of times. From Paris airport to, to Bonn and the capital of the wine country in Burgundy. Another couple hours up, three hours up to the heights of the Alps and Chamonix. Again, I'm not faster by train this time because local trains take over, although certainly doable in the day. Let's get going. In Burgundy, the countryside is sophisticated and calm as the residence. If you've come to see quintessential France, you've arrived at the right place in Burgundy. For here, the landscapes are crisscrossed with canals and beautiful canal boats like this. I described that one in the guidebook, by the way. Lovely uh, Romanesque chapels like this one in Brancion and Hill Towns, far off the normal beaten path. And of course, the cuisine is world famous. Snails cooked in garlic sauce, coco vin, red meat from the Charolais cattle, the white cattle, simmered in red wine, red wine for hours. Coco vin, rooster, cooked in red wine for hours. Eux amarette, zoo amarette, if you're French. Oofs, if you're American, <laughs> phonetically, is my favorite of those dishes. And those are eggs, uh, poached eggs, again, served in a red wine, cooked in a red wine sauce. There's something about red wine in this area, isn't there? Right? Bone, I mentioned before, is the perfect base for touring the Burgundian area. All right, this is a few 20 minutes from our house, and I spend a lot of time in the city. It's a lovely, quintessentially French town of 25,000 people and capital of the wine industry here. So there's many chances to taste wine in the town of Bone. It works well if you don't have a car, does, does the Burgundian, does Burgundy. Its most famous monument, there's one site that's important to see outside of the wineries for most Americans, and that's its medieval hospital here that I'm showing you, the Hospice de Bonne. You'll see medieval other examples of the Middle Ages in churches and castles, uh, hill towns and walled cities, right? But rarely will you see a hospital from the Middle Ages, particularly one as glorious as this one. How is it that this classically, by the way, tiled Burgundian roof and hospital is in such great state of repair if it's from the Middle Ages? Mind you, Middle Ages, when? The nurses were, were, were nuns, and the primary antidote to any or cure was bloodletting. When you travel through this museum, you get to see examples of the, what looks like a caulking gun that we would let blood from people's heads. And of course, as a modern day person, you realize that you were far better off in the Middle Ages outside this hospital rather than within because the idea of infection had not yet arrived. And oftentimes, two to three, even sometimes, uh, patients would lie in these narrow beds. But the reason this hospital looks like this today is that it was used as a hospital until 1971. It's a, that makes it remarkable alone, right? Incredible, right? And it's unique in the world because of its financing technique, the method of financing every year. Over the hundreds of years that this hospital has existed, when people died, they would donate their land if they were saved and it felt like they were well treated at the hospital to the Hospice de Bonne and to the nuns, etc. That land eventually grew great wine. That means that this hospital is one of the greatest landholders of vineyards in Burgundy. And every year they do an annual selling of their wine. It's the famous wine that determine, auction that determines the price of wine throughout the world almost. It, the auction in Bonne every third, it's coming up. Third week of November. Anyway, that's fascinating. <laughs> right. Bone has great market days, two days a week, Wednesdays and uh, particularly Saturdays. I love the Saturday market in Bone. We never miss one when we're there. The best thing to do, I think, the best place to rent a bike 
in all of France is Burgundy because short distance from Bone, easy to do, great guys running the bike rental store. In a couple miles, you're there. You're in the villages along these wine service roads. Cars don't use these roads. Maybe tractors do if they're tending to their grapes. Bicycle riders have free run then throughout the vineyards, running village, wine village to wine village. It's a glorious area. The prettiest vineyards, I think, in France are here in Burgundy. And, t and stop to taste along the way if you want to. I wouldn't drink too much if you're riding your bicycle, but I'm probably feeling better about that than if I were driving a car. So I list two different bike loops that you can do because it is utterly so easy to do. Uh, and bike-only lanes and paths and well-signed paths allow you to do so. The, um, the importance of abbeys in Europe and in France's history come to life more in Burgundy than anywhere else. Thanks to the abbey at Cluny, the most powerful, Abbey in Europe's history, or which had over 2,000 dependent churches and abbeys based on it, and vi vied with the uh, church in Rome, St. Peter's, the Vatican, for power for a period of time. We have Burgundy's um, importance with abbeys like this one, and this one at Fontenay is maybe one of the best examples, perfectly preserved for you to visit today to understand. This is a, a Cistercian Abbey, St. Bernard. Um, thanks to him, constructed in the 1200s. And for, for the 1200s and 1300s, this abbey flourished all the way really until the French Revolution for 700 years. This mini city gathered the knowledge and kept the knowledge that was lost after the fall of Rome and the barbarian invasions and the Dark Ages. Monks retreated to places just like this or the island abbey of Mont Saint-Michel to study the workings of the clock, to illuminate manuscripts, to um, study metalworking. The first forge in, European, in Europe arrives here at the Abbey at Fontenay. And thanks to abbeys like this, Europe's and France in particular, makes it through the Dark Ages. People start moving back into cities thanks to the techniques, the study of wine and cheese in particular at abbeys like Fontenay. And here, just an hour outside of Bone, you can get that sense of, uh, of abbey life. My favorite site in France today is being built. The castle at Guédelon is a daring move by the French private entrepreneurs. Imagine building a castle using from the 1200s, the blueprints that we have, drawings designed in the year 1200 from the king of Philip the Fair. Imagine building a castle using only the tools and techniques of the year 1200 and building it taking 40 years. They're, they're 20 years into it today at Guédelon, which you're looking at here. Nobody knows of this site. It's kind of in a remote corner of Burgundy anyway. We have deviated two of our tours to visit it. We think it's so important. The reason they did this, they built this, they're building this castle, is to learn there's so much we don't know, ironically, about the construction of medieval castles. And it they're, they're learning as they go. And also, it's a great showpiece for children, for tourists to understand, to see how rocks are taken right out of the quarry nearby and then dressed into squares and rectangles and then pulled up the, the, the squirrel wheel continuing the, the structure taller and taller. It's all happening in front of your eyes when you visit. Is it at the castle of Guédelon? That's Burgundy's latest site. For many people, though, that's nothing compared to being face-to-face -face with the awesome Alps. Whether you're in Switzerland or France or Italy, the Alps are one of the most remarkable mountain ranges in the world. And here, there's, I don't think there's a better place in Europe to appreciate the drama of the Alps and the glaciers that you can see flowing down from the high Alps in France, just two and a half hours east of Bowen of Burgundy. Here, melted cheese matters. You won't find this in most, I mean, there'll be fondue places, but this is every restaurant in the Alps where you'll find fondue, melted cheese, right? Or raclette or tartiflette, which is my favorite. And if you've never heard of tartiflette, it's scalloped potatoes with melted cheese. It's always melted cheese over the top. All of these dishes, of course, keep people warm in the winter in these cold climates. There's a reason for it, right? A lot of cows produce lots of cheese in this area, too. Two sites I recommend, two cities for basing yourself for, for appreciating the French Alps. The most beautiful city in France, and I think maybe arguably in Europe, Annecy, pronounced Annecy. 50,000 people laced with canals, arcaded walkways, a glorious situation um, town on the Lake of Annecy. The Alps are a little bit in the distance. They're not right there for you to hike up right in, in front of you, but for a lakeside visit of the Alps, Annecy 
competes very favorably with any Swiss city from Lucerne to Geneva uh, that I've ever seen with a fraction of the price for hotels and better food and wine anyway, right? Here you can travel around the lake. There's a path that goes halfway up the lake. Rent a bike. Everybody's renting bikes here these days. It's like Green Lake. Right around the lake, halfway, 45 minutes or so at an average pace, then pull your bike onto one of the steamships that runs about every two hours and come back rolling your bike to the city of Ansi via boat. Or rent a paddle boat, but get out into the lake a little bit. Lakefront alpine sightseeing is brilliant in the city of Ansi, but if it's the Alps in your lap that you must have, if you need to go hiking, if you need to stand face to face with those glaciers and highest peaks in Europe, then to Chamonix you must go. Chamonix Mont Blanc, as it's called, is a town of about 2,000 people whose entire existence has always been devoted to exploration of the mountains. In the late 1700s, early 1800s, when the mountains became no longer obstacles in, in the way, but obstacles of desire, we're going to attack that mountain and climb it because it's there. Chamonix was perfectly positioned to do so. And today, every, every street name in the, in the town of Chamonix is named for a famous mountain climber. People come to Chamonix from around the world to study the heroic list of climbers, to understand what they did. And by the way, traveling in this city, in the French Alps, they do a brilliant job of explaining the history of mountaineering as well as the history of, the, of glaciers and their current status today. But we'll talk about that more. But for you, the most incredible thing you can do from the downtown of Chamonix is to ride a cable car up to 7,000 feet, then transfer to another one to get up to 12,800 feet to the top edge of the side of the, of Mont, the massive of Mont Blanc. 12,800 feet, dress warmly. Huh? Right? This is open most of the year, by the way. Um, then, <laughs> from the rooftop, from the, I love this next slide, from the, the, the French are crazy. They're, they're nuts. Only the French would build a glass platform hanging from the edge of this building that you're looking at with a 3,000 foot drop below to allow tourists to do this. This started just last year. I thought the tourist office was kidding me. And then I went back the next year and I saw it, sure enough. Wow, this is incredible. And there are many other things to see at 12,800 feet right next to Mont Blanc, but the greatest thing you can do, and there, there are expositions of mountaineering and of glaciers and this kind of thing here really, in restaurants and the whole thing. But the greatest thing you can do is hop into one of these little teacups and travel at 12,500 feet or 800 feet with you and your partner. They can fit no more than four per car and cross over to Italy. We used to have to say, bring your passport. And then drop down the other side if you want to on a similar lurking cable car down in the Italian city of Courmayeur and off to Esta, A-O-S-T-A, a beautiful city, and on to Milan if that's what you want. There can be no greater European border crossing than this that I've just showed you at 12,000 feet. You'll pass the Matterhorn on the left and all these, I'm serious, all the, Switzerland is right there. Wow. That's worth going to Chamonix alone. I don't know anywhere else in the world that does that. Then drop back down, on your way back down to Chamonix, get off halfway that I mentioned where the transfer was, and hike Chamonix, this region's greatest hike, from the Aiguille du Midi, which is what that great lift is called, to the Mer de Glace glacier here below. Eight mile long, one of the greatest, the greatest glacier in, Fran in the French Alps. Drop down, um, it, it's a, anyway, drop down to the cogwheel train to take you back down to the city of Chamonix. That's about a three hour hike for anybody. Rapid walkers can do it in two hours, but it is, it undulates up and down, but it's a brilliant hike. If that's too much hiking for you, throughout, just above the city, there are easier trails that I describe in the book to get you up to some of these chalets with great views and a glass of wine or hot, hot toddy or coffee, just to enjoy the mountains all around you without so much effort. On the opposite side of Chamonix Valley, there are lifts and, and cable cars taking you on the mountains that hem it on the other side just as well. It's a little bit claustrophobic in Chamonix because you're surrounded by high mountain peaks. Burgundy and Chamonix and the Alps, pardon me, the French Alps, combine together for a brilliant five or six days of your time on a trip to France. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll find lots more at ricksteves.com and on my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Happy travels and thanks for joining us.